This is the Brain Software Podcast, episode 240, originating in the hypnotic world epicenter, Toronto, Canada, and it's the only podcast you need. I'm Chris Thompson, and today on episode 240, Mike Mandel and I are going to reveal the secrets of dynamic presentation skills, so stay tuned. Disclaimer, this is where you're supposed to be, so deal with it. Enjoy the content, but not in a dickish kind of dick kind of way. Hang in there. It'll all make sense next year. Hey, man. Let's get real, Pouch. I'm living in Meaford now, Scroll. Fredo's letting me live above his garage, and I'm loving Gray County. But let me ask that musical question. Whatever happened to all the really cool people in the world who listen to the Grateful Dead? And why does everyone you meet these days seem like a major dick? Uh, ha, 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 ha. Uh, these, these are, are days, days of victory. victory, so please welcome to the center stage that neck-cranking, bag-ripping, mannish boy, who's also the Keith Richards of hypnosis, Mike Mandel, everybody. Chris, I'm oh, so oh, glad to be here. We want oh, you guys to be yes. very first to know we have just completed the recording of an immense task, which is Mike Mandel Hypnosis Academy 2.0. That's right. So here we are. Ten years later, we have finished recording the Academy version two. It's about to launch in the in the coming weeks. And we decided because we can. Off. We're drinking a little bit of Irish whiskey on this episode. So just a tiny little amount. But. Oh. It's so approachable. Mm. Beautiful. This was a bottle, a Jameson whiskey, yeah. that my in-laws brought back from a trip to Ireland. It's not surprising. And it was Ireland, gifted yeah. to me. So I thought you would appreciate we'll it's beautiful. pour ourselves a little sip. And we're not having much. We want right. you to see it's just a little bit. But I just want to Colonel I just want to point out this. that when you're self-employed in <laughs> Self, self, right, self it's employed. already working when you're yeah. self-employed and, ac and accountable to no one yeah. except for our wives. Well, there was that. And the police. And the police. Yeah. No one can fire us for drinking, drinking at, work. at work. So there we it's go. It's fantastic. <laughs> so don't model your life on ours. Well, yes, you can, but not that part. All right. So, so listen, we're going to talk all about presentation skills today. Yes. This is something I actually really wanted us to do an episode on this because Mike has been a keynote speaker, a presenter. Just the skills, the hypnosis and the confidence and the congruence on stage mm -hmm. and some of the body language skills, I think are going to be really useful. Before we get into that, we have to do our think tank words yes, of the day. Chris. Oh, and we should probably mention, we have just opened the doors to our eight-week online live training called Foundations Live. Brilliant. If you go to our website and you click on the events link, so MikeMandelHypnosis.com, you'll see an events link or just type slash events. And you'll find Foundations Live there. It's eight week of awesome hypno eight weeks of awesome hypnosis training where you use the academy lessons we've already given you, soon to be version two. Yes. And then you come to Zoom and you practice this stuff with us in a small group, which is totally awesome. So more on that later. But yeah, if you want to know, weeks, it's once a week. It's once a week for it. Yeah. Every day, it's a yeah. one hour. It's about a two hour. Not uh, one, not one hour. Our our guest trainings are one hour, but it's about two hours a week for eight weeks. So it's really awesome, but it's taught in bite-sized chunks. And by the time you get to about week three, you start going, oh, this hypnosis stuff is actually pretty easy. Yeah. And that's the point. All right. Excellent. So let's do our think tank now, words once and again, then content. The think tank words, I drew them from the web up mm -hmm. in our cabin in the Great White North because I don't have access to my Savile Book of Czech think tank, but will in a week. So when you're back in Toronto. Three words. I, we're back in Toronto on Monday. Mm -hmm. So today. Three days. Oh man. I've been up north for Pretty well three months. Yeah, we're recording this on October 20th, so you're going to uh, be back soon. All right. Halloween. See, my wife has a theory. Halloween follows Labor Day, mm -hmm. and Christmas follows Halloween. Is that it's a just, theory or a fact? It's bang, bang, bang. It's yeah. just so fast. It, it seems, does. Yeah. Time seems so to accelerate. So here's our three words. Chris, I'm going to get okay. them up front. We'll let you disimpact them. Okay. So let's start with <laughs> presence. Presence. Introduction. Introduction. And activity. I am always so pleased when I know all three words. I have like trauma from prior podcasts where there was one word and I go, I don't know what that yeah. even means. I'm just like going to skip it. All right. So let's talk about it. And then the whole point here is these spark some creativity. They're just randomly chosen words. How do they fit into the they context of our lives? And pattern matching right. system. Yeah. Exactly. All right. all right. So presence actually 
Isn't that a, a funny that that showed up? Since it's we're presence, talking about present. presentation oh, skill, got it. Good, presentation good. skill. So nice. presence, it makes me think about when somebody is speaking. Do they have presence, mm. or do they kind of meekishly? Yeah, I was thinking about uh, oh. how might might be nice to oh. go on that vacation. And, no, you want to have presence, and yeah. presence to me. Oh is somebody who lights up the room. Yeah. They come across with that Mandel triangle. They yeah, have confidence. They have congruence. Yeah. And they deliver their message with intention or conviction, nice. if we want to use the other C. Brilliant. So, so there we go. An introduction. introduction. Yes. You know, your life is an introduction to the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Life is short. Introduce different things into your life. An introduction of or new how, techniques, and how new about learnings. This guitars. podcast episode is an introduction. This, yeah, it's an introduction to Jameson Whiskey, but it's also an introduction into how to change your presentation skills and your confidence. This is an introduction. This podcast episode on its own will not make you a brilliant presenter or speaker or anything like that, Dang. but it'll certainly give you the material to apply Hurrah! so that once you've been introduced, you can apply it and then you can get awesome. And you can get, uh, mm -hmm. you can get awesome at activities, Chris. Right. We want to have activity a lot being of our activities third word. in our life that mm -hmm. are productive. When we introduce new ideas, mm -hmm. we have a sense of presence, the activities grow and before long, everything's just smashing. Yeah. And you know what, actually, this makes me think of is the, uh, so activity, we all have activities that we're good at and we have activities that we would like to be better at. So yeah. if presentation, uh, it could even be, here's my iPhone. So let's say you want to get better at making social video, social media videos right. for your business, et cetera. Yeah. You're going to apply these things. Think of an activity that you're already freaking awesome at. And what makes you awesome? What mindset do you have? What do you believe about yourself in that moment? And apply that to this new That's really activity. Good. That's solid. I couldn't there you say go. anything funny. All right. There you go. To, but I thought Thank it was you. too interesting. I'm not going to All right. It. Well, then cheers right. to that. So, okay. <laughs> Hey, oh, quick whiskey comment. Okay. You know Tullamore Dew, which you like as well as yes. I do. Yes. Very gentle Irish whiskey. I really am appreciating Irish this soft, great. approachable you know Irish. It's not called Tullamore Dew. What's it called? The D, If you look on the bottle, it's D period, E period, W period. It's Tullamore. Oh. And Daniel E. Williams was the, was the, the creator of it. You tell me that. Okay, so it's not Tullamore Dew. It's Tullamore D E W. Anyway, everybody does. So. Right. Well, Here at we least go. it's not Tullamore Dew. So Dick. why? <laughs> All right. That's right. Um, are you pre framing the amazing Black Friday event that's coming up soon? Well, yeah, I suppose we well, may as well. Yes. We are working on MMHA version two wrapped up into, instead of a Black Friday sale this year, we're going to do a big launch event for Ooh. MMHA version two. Yeah. So stick around, make sure you're on our mailing it's list, MikeMandelHypnosis.com. You'll find some way to get on that mailing list. And oh, it's going to be awesome. All right. You know, so I, that's I'm it. I'm thinking so much about that whiskey is making the podcast better for everybody, including us. Good. I'm thinking we should we have a bottle of uh, like Buffalo Trace bourbon down here and just top up our glasses That's every time hilarious. we do a podcast. Oh, okay. right. Why presentation skills, Chris? Why? Well, they are, I mean, if oh. you want to communicate with people, I, I'm, I'm struggling right now with yeah, my yeah, own I'm presentation skills. Yeah. Why would you want to have great presentation skills? Do you need to influence other people in your life? It could be anything from presenting to your friends, to your spouse, to anybody. But think about presentation skills in the way most people do. Let's say you're in a job interview and you want to present yourself uh -oh. as the ideal candidate. Let's yep. say you're giving a presentation in school and you want to stand up at the front, front of the classroom and you want to impress the teacher and the teacher is going to be noticing the attentiveness of the other students of the room. So if they're all sleepy and on their phones, no, then that gets picked up unconsciously right. by the person grading your performance. So you want to have an engaging presentation that people are actually paying attention to because they're interested, not because they have to. That's good, Chris. Right. And having that kind of skill is important. It started with me in high school because I was a timid, beaten up mm -hmm. kid. By high school, I was starting to come into my own. And I was always a bit of a ham and liked being in front of the group. So we had English, English class or um, not even theater arts yet, but English class. And I used to put my hand up. Mr. Tomlinson or Mr. Thomas would say, yes, Mike. And I'd say, could we do more oral compositions and oral book reports? And the whole class is like, oh, <laughs> they, no, they're, no, they're mad at you. I still love doing them. Okay. Oh, that's Give hilarious. Give me a chance to grant. So All right. So let's, let's I'm gonna go for while it. you're adjusting the you. nasal area. I'm done. Can I get so, you to give an overview of the Mandel Triangle? This oh, is your yes, invention or at discovery. least your model. It always existed. Mandel mm. Triangle. Think of a... a an equilateral triangle, obviously three sides, because that's the funny thing about triangles, boys and girls. 
It has three sides. Mm. Look at you. Um, confidence, congruence, and conviction, which is intention. And if you ma master these mm -hmm. three, if you present with confidence, if you're congruent, so all your body language, your internal state, your internal dialogue is all sending one single message like mine is right now. Mm -hmm. And if you do things with conviction, you expect things to work, you put your intention behind them. All yeah. of this with a letter C in the middle, which is calibration. Yes, you got to see the yeah. response you're getting. Sorry, you're I was thinking about, in, in that moment, I was thinking, Seven we have judge. conviction, we have intention, and we have expectation. They're all kind of the same conviction, conviction intention, or yeah. expectation. Oh, I I to me, the they're triangle. all part and parcel of the same thing. We like to call it conviction on the Mandel Triangle because it's a C, 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 <laughs> right? There right. you go. And then in the middle, yeah, you asked me at that very moment, what's in the middle? Because I could Calib Calibration well, is what's in the middle. You're always calibrating what's going on around you. Right? I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Jameson right now for making this podcast. Very okay, thank you. Okay, so when you practice this, when you practice these three, mm -hmm. any one of them that you improve will improve the other two as well. It's a useful way of looking at communication. When you master the Mandel Triangle, you will have credibility. Yeah. I'll give you a quick example. Got wonderful examples here. Years ago, I had a company, we were doing a thing called Experts. We'd go into any company. This is pre-internet, so nobody could check on us in disguise. Oh, yeah, that wouldn't would work now. Claim to be an expert in their field. Only the person who brought us in knew it was a comedy act, yeah. me and my friend John Belbeck. And I would come in as an expert on their field. I would start talking about their field. I'd have all their buzzwords down, and they'd be listening. And then it would just start to get weird, and they wouldn't know why. <laughs> and at and some point, they'd, they'd figure it out, right? It was a podcast. Like, it was a... It, Start again. Then they'd realize that it was a comedy act and would relax. Yeah, but not I a was podcast. so congruent. I did one for a major pharmaceutical company. Their name is here in front, but I'm not going to say it. And this was at about 8 a.m. And I went up there as Dr. Nigel Parn, glasses on, hair in a ponytail, said I was from head office. I was a medical doctor with a law degree. Yeah. And this guy, oh, better listen to this guy. And I said, we have found a way of getting aconitum napellus, which kills all known rhinovirus inside a cell without damaging the integrity of the cell. We have, and I'm shortening it, but that we had a nose spray that delivers this past the cell membranes. Ladies and gentlemen, our company has a nose spray that cures the common cold in six hours. They gave me standing ovation. Yeah. And, it, and then you said on the, the break, the the people back, were like calling the their stockbrokers and I stuff. I call my wife to invest in our stock. This is going to be huge. I said, we'll be releasing this to, on CNN in 14 minutes. Everyone was so excited. It was absolute crap. I was making it up. I, I, I <laughs> don't even have a high school education. But by practicing my own Mandel Triangle, I came across as so congruent, so authoritative, there was not one person in that room who did not believe me. All right, so with that said, what are some of the keys to making all of that happen? Okay, build up some basic mm -hmm. communication skills when you're speaking to a group or social media, whatever. All of these apply on social media too, folks. Mm -hmm. Don't mutter. Don't mumble. Speak clearly. Enunciate. Yeah. Now, you don't have to do it in these crazy ways where people almost, crazy ways where people almost make it sound like they putting an A at the end of everything. I want you to enunciate ta. That, That's crazy. Don't do that. This matters a lot if you're delivering your presentation in a language that is not your native language. Yes. So uh, if you have a thick accent, let's say you're Eastern European and you speak with a really thick accent and you're trying to speak in English, just slow down a little bit and enunciate. Brilliant. That's right. Um, I was at a conference for graphoanalysis in Chicago. I did a week's internship there. The keynote speaker was a dentist. This mm -hmm. is many years ago, so I can talk about it now. And he was a terrible speaker. I mean, he really was. How he got the gig, I have no idea. His thing was he didn't mumble, but whenever he wanted to make an important point, instead of emphasizing it, pausing, he'd get quieter. And that would be annoying. You couldn't hear a damn thing he was saying. So speak clearly. Mm -hmm. oh, make eye contact with members of your audience. This is powerful. If I'd be speaking to people, you know, I've done keynotes to 3,000 people, and I'll be looking. If there's an area of the room where people are fussing with their phone or something, I'll focus on that area for a while and talk to them and, and aim to bring them into the loop. Look at people. I was front row center with my wife for Jordan Peterson in Toronto at the Queen Elizabeth Theatre, and he does a thing where he'll go up to the very edge of the stage and talk to one or two people for like 45 seconds, just right to you. And we're sitting there going, ah, Jordan Peterson's talking to us. It was powerful beyond belief. So I've adopted that as well whenever I'm speaking, which of course isn't very often anymore. Yeah. But yeah. And listen to this. Pause. Because it's powerful. Don't be motor mouth. Take pregnant pauses. 
Especially like when there's an important point you want people to really be hanging on and considering. Nice. Well done. Right. Pausing is powerful. Mm-hmm. But be funny. Get some funny lines. Don't make it stupid stuff that's typical. And if you're too serious, it'll actually bore people. You want to elicit different states from them. You're going to engage their emotions, but humor is a very powerful thing. You can't just copy other people. I really like, yeah, you you inject, you don't make the whole thing just some hilarious presentation. It's serious. It's got content, but then there are funny things that happen. You have, you have prepared lines, and then you have some interesting things that just happen. Like, example, let's say... I can remember, and, and you've done this many times, but you only do it when it's appropriate. You don't have it planned in advance. Right. Something right. like, let's say you're you're flipping a piece of paper over a flip chart, yep. and all the markers fall off. You know, you'll right. just look at the audience and say something like, "Don't worry, I've got it. I've yeah, got it." Sit, sit. Implication that sit. they were all, all going to rush up, up and, and pick up these markers that I, fell or something. The timing is it gr- gets a yes. great laugh. If you watch my keynote for Hypnothoughts Live in 2019, mm-hmm. I go on my best laughs on the spot, saying, "You know, we're talking about the world of hypnosis," and I said, "I got some information from my friend Carl Smith, mm-hmm. which is absolute wisdom. It's true." And I paused and I said. Now, granted, it may be the only piece of wisdom Carl has ever dispensed and got a terrific laugh, including from Carl. I yeah. So, yeah, yeah, a couple of things like that. Throw them in and liven things up. Now, stand tall. I I, I don't root naturally because i got a bad neck, but I have to force myself to stand tall. Send strong body language mm-hmm. and do not pace up and down. It looks nervous. It looks unfocused. I saw a hypnotist in Winnipeg years ago, and not only did he pace, but he's sort of bow-legged <laughs> it, and he, he had hunched over and he just paced up and down with this bow-legged look back and forth you for his will, entire show. It was terrible. If you physically seem visually weak, yep. y- you will yes. come across emotionally weak too. That's very good. I'm yeah. going to write that down. And be a master of the microphone. If you're doing a presentation, mm-hmm. I recommend use a countryman microphone. It's tiny, fits behind the ear, tape it onto your head so it doesn't waggle around. Like if you're on stage, for sure. Yeah. If you're on stage or a platform, but I worked with a guy years ago. He had a microphone and he was just learning to present. And he was, here's his microphone and he's talking and he's waving it around like this while he's talking. So the volume's going rub, up and down. Rub, and, and I adjusted it, put it in front yeah. of him. He was furious with me. You know, said, when you when you mentioned uh, being front row center for Jordan Peterson and how he would make direct, right. direct eye contact with people, I think the same is true. Now, in a podcast, it's a bit different. We're talking to each other much of the time. Mostly but sometimes we do look directly at the camera yes. and make eye contact. Now, when we're doing a different style of video, like an online sales presentation or something like that, we're looking at the camera and we're making eye contact with you. Yes. Right. And I think the same is true if you're doing, because more people probably who are listening are not out professionally presenting on stage, but with every other context, classroom, giving a presentation to a group, a physical group, making eye contact with people, or very commonly social media videos. And these selfie cameras, what will happen these days is you'll look at your screen and it's too obvious to everyone that's watching right. that you're not making eye contact with them. You're looking at yourself. You're very good at this. I'm getting better I'm at doing it. The bad you're very good at looking at the camera uh, yeah. and you just here's know here's peripherally here's that you're in the frame and you're Eye contact is on the camera. Okay, now here's the bad news. Mm-hmm. Here's where we are. Uh oh. Look at this. We've got a huge Look list of things to do. And we do. So we'll, we we'll hurry them. through. Gonna, we'll give you some. Hurry in the hurry. We're going to give you a lot of fine points. Okay, here. watch okay. out for repetitive, stupid gestures. I worked um, years ago, did a presentation. There's a guy who went on in front of me, he was a medical doctor, and he was terrible. He held a remote in one hand because he was doing that horrible PowerPoint thing where, you know, he's reading his presentation oh, to you. Oh, that's the worst. But every time he spoke, He'd step to the right, do this with his hand. Then he'd step to the left, do this with his hand. Step to the, he did that for his entire half hour. So he doesn't look, he doesn't seem natural. Maybe the first or second time, it's fine. But then it becomes this ridiculous thing that people are going to make fun of, right? And even if they don't do it in reality, in their own mind, they're thinking, the guy, he just keeps doing this dickish thing. It's not natural. The thing that nuts too is when someone models a mannerism because they like it. Yeah. And this guy, uh, for one, not that, that's just speaking poorly. This guy had glasses on. And when he wanted to make a point, and at the end he'd say, and there were 200 submarines at that time, he'd go, with his glasses. And they'd say something else and he'd go, keep like, I, I, I want to punch him in the Like head. a salute to the glasses. Oh, there was one other thing I wanted <laughs> to mention. Salute to the glasses. Uh, yeah. I'll drink to that. There's a really 
important point here that comes up in the context of when you explained pausing, the use of pauses, right? Yeah. It's so much better than the filler phrases. Oh, when you learn to pause, to peckers, yeah. you will, yeah, well, okay, I'll let you get to it then yeah. because pausing fixes filler the filler phrase phrases. problem. You got it. So avoid the repetitive gestures. People model things they like. Mm -hmm. Paul Moyer and I did a documentary years ago and he was behind the camera. And every time he's behind the camera, obviously he'd seen someone do this and liked it. He's a nine, he's yeah. not gonna copy it. Every time he's behind the camera, he'd have a toothpick in his mouth, just going, Oh, he's rolling it around his mouth. And they were talking, interviewing. He gets back behind the camera. And it's the, the only in context mouth. in the world in which he'd have a toothpick in his mouth. No, just yeah. Rolling it around. It just drove me nuts. Okay. Uh, now we're on to the one Chris said. Lose the word whiskers. Mm -hmm. They disempower you. Um, like, you um, know, um, um, right? sort saying, of. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. And I said, I saw the guy in the great courses, kept saying, okay. And he was a good professer. But finally it turned into N-K-E-H. -E okay. No, just not even, just... <laughs> okay, That's Okay, now Jupiter's 500 miles further. Oh, it was terrible. Get rid of the word whiskers. They will disempower you. Have 100%. a point. Have Don't a point. Don't ramble. Have yes. a freaking point. Rambling is terrible. Trying to find your thread again. Be cogent. Be simple. Keep yes. it clear. Pause when you speak. The idea of going on and on and doing what Timothy refers to as a data dump. Oh. Don't data dump. No. And w what we call unnecessary, long, pointless stories, we call them Ken Sweatman yes. stories, in case <laughs> you're wondering what that means. Yeah. And I call this practicing anti-Sweatman. So wow. how tight can you present your point and still get the point across congruently and then move on? Brevity is the right. soul of wit. And still moving. Hit the stage with energy. Mm -hmm. I, uh, my... Uh, Agent years ago, Martin Promuter, he said, Mike Mandel is the ACDC of speakers. He said, nobody wants to follow Nobody me. wants to go on after and you. And so I would yeah. literally, in my 60s, they announced me, I wouldn't walk up like a six. I'd sprint onto the stage and hit the stage yeah. with energy. And people go, wow, this guy's in good shape. And he's got, bring your energy to the stage. You have time afterwards to decompress and get tired. But yeah. bring all your energy to the stage and keep it simple. Don't bring in concepts that are really complicated to show people how much you know about quantum physics or something. Keep it simple. I read an interview with George Carlin, who I greatly respect, years ago, though, in Playboy, which I only ever bought for the articles. I never looked at the mm -hmm, pictures mm -hmm. at all. But um, they're asking him something, and he went off on a huge tirade about planets and this, you know, the solar system, because it's something that was interesting to him, but it yeah. was irrelevant in the context of what they were doing. That's so a really important point. Just because something interests you doesn't justify turning it into a long freaking thank you. Can You're of right. worms. Yeah. <laughs> a can of sweatman. Now also dress the part. Dress for your audience. Look like them. Uh, don't show up in sweatpants. And it's a terrible thing to do. We had a guy show up at our Christmas party with 60 people years ago. They're all dressed nicely, sports jackets. And we put on a spread with a couple of caterers. He shows up in gray sweatpants and a sweatshirt and sneakers. Like, yeah, didn't it have looks, a freaking clue. He looked like a dick. And at the other end of the spectrum, you're not going to wear some ridiculous fancy attire when it's right, like one a hypnotist, casual professional one environment. One hypnotist who I will not name. Huh. He showed up at George Brown College for a noon show, a nooner show with college kids wearing a tuxedo. Yeah. And they're all looking at him like, who the hell is this dick? I thought oh, you always right. had a perfect balance there. You you never wear a necktie no. or, or even, well, I guess, did you ever wear a suit or was always just, sometimes it was a, a suit. sports jacket yeah. and jeans. Yeah. Or sometimes it would be a black suit or whatever. Yeah. But a nice blazer, a nice dress shirt underneath, a nice pair of pants, and confidence. That's it. That's it. Mm -hmm. Know your material inside out. Uh, you know, when I do um, AOH, when we teach architecture of hypnosis, I've been doing hypnosis since 1975 professionally. Mm -hmm. And 10 years earlier than that, I started. And I still, Chris will tell you, I spend a week just power loading sharpening the blade sharpening the blade so that the most obscure hypnotic fact I know, and I know where to find it and so on. Even though I know the material, I want to make sure it's even more refined. Make sure you know your stuff inside out. So if there's Q&A, you can answer those questions. It's easier to be confident when you're confident in your knowledge being well above average nice compared to the people Chris. that you're speaking to. There you go. Use the entire stage or platform if mm -hmm. you're presenting. Don't stand behind a freaking podium. When I did theater sports and we were an undefeated theater sports team called the Beatles, and then they were afraid of lawsuits, we changed it to not the Beatles. <laughs> and it was fantastic. We never lost. Kids in the hall, we blew them off the stage, but we used the whole stage. That's what I learned from theater sports. Stand behind a podium. You're hiding. You're, yeah, you're hiding. It yes. looks terrible. Get out there and present yourself. It is a good people. metaphor for being, you know, like... 
I remember, I just did two filler words right there. You know, like it reminds me Appalling. of building a snow fort in the winter as a young kid. What? And we would hide behind the snow fort wall to be able to launch snowballs yeah. in a snowball fight, right? Yeah. Well, if you're hiding behind your podium, just cowering, not can't confident. Can't be hit by Yeah, that's what it makes me think of is you're just hiding. If you're using body language, we talk about this in body language too, right? Yeah. If you position yourself in a chair all kind of awkward and huddled. Look you look like you're protecting yourself. Yeah. Specific Take areas. a lot of space yeah. when you're sitting. Take That's up right. some space, move around. That's how you present the Treat image the of a confident as person. as an unnecessary, massive fiberglass athletic support. Don't, don't freaking wear it. <laughs> That's great. Okay, now, um, here's a good one. Uh, we said no Ken Sweatman stories. We we totally know that. Here's one. Don't drink alcohol before you present. Ever. Yes, unless you're celebrating the completion of a major project like the Mike Mandel Hypnosis Academy version two after 10, 10 years. That's been essentially a year in the making and it's a super small quantity. It but yeah, you do now. not want to be, oh, I'm nervous. I'll have a couple of drinks, so I'll loosen up. Yeah. No, what will happen is you'll start to lose your thread. You won't be able to draw yourself back to your material nearly as well. Your calibration skills will go out the yep. window. You'll feel you're and doing better than you are. Depending on your tolerance, if you sound like you're slurring, you're slurring your speech a little bit out there. That's Bad not news. good, right? Bro, I had a friend, I still have a friend, who was a, a hypnotist, stage hypnotist, um, R-rated sort of show. Good guy, though. And he told me his capacity for booze was so high. They would line up in the universities when he'd do a show or in a bar, 15 shots of oh, vodka geez. on the bar. And all through the show, he'd run over and drink another one. 15 shots Are you of telling vodka. me this guy did 15 shots, shots of vodka during between... During a show. Two-hour show, maybe? I wouldn't even yeah. get like four oh, in. I'd probably be passed out. No. Okay. Now, know your audience. Um, I was at Mont Blanc and I did a presentation. And it was a keynote and it went really well until I made a classic mistake. I talked about how people watch too much television, turn your TV off. Mm -hmm. I was presenting to a cable TV company. Oops. Yeah. Mistake. Oops. Mistake. Did not yeah. go over well. Yeah. Even I make mistakes. Um, remember my friend, the NLP trainer who just seen Tony Robbins, he explodes on the Oh TV. yeah. Hey everybody, turn to the person beside you. Say, I'm feeling great. Know your audience And they're just looking at the him. Lesson. These are all accountants like, who the heck is this idiot? And then he brilliantly went, now, don't you hate that kind of presentation? Let's set that aside. And, yeah. And he changed gears, but know who they are. Make sure your stuff is appropriate. We got one more and then we got to go to a quick message here. Pull at people's emotions, but don't be maudlin. What does that mean? Maudlin, you know, you know, like really, oh, and I just love you. Oh, he's a true human being. He's such oh. a, don't be freaking maudlin. But if you can trigger the emotions of people, you'll get a great response. And I see, mm -hmm. I've missed this. Remember PowerPoint, it really sucked. I never used it, refused to. Oh, send us your PowerPoint stuff first. I don't use it. What? I used to use a, a flip chart, paper point, I called it, because it became a prop right. as well. But memory jogs are okay. I recommend bullet points mm -hmm. on a card in your pocket. But if you want to see what you can do without memory jogs, and I'm not being smart ass here, watch my presentation on YouTube, HypnoThoughts Live Keynote 2019. They wanted 30 minutes. I think I did like 29 minutes with no no notes, nothing. I rehearsed it walking through Minden, Ontario right. out loud. You can get it nailed so you mm -hmm, don't need mm -hmm. anything and you'll be most natural if you do that. I'll just touch on the PowerPoint point yeah, you that, that you made because I think this is an important one. I've seen a lot of business presentations in my time. Everything from fantastic presentations yeah. to people presenting ma spreadsheets, massive amounts of data, yeah. almost written to the uh, to the to the exact word well, try. where they're literally reading their slides of people. Yeah. And there's a magic behind this. If you put ridiculous complexity on a slide, it will not be interesting at all to anyone ever. Just remember <laughs> this. If you use slides correctly, it's maybe a phrase or a picture and a phrase or something like that. It's interesting, but it's not... You, it's not useful on its own. It should, put it this way. If you ever design a presentation where you want to use slides, the test, the acid test on this is, if they hadn't seen the presentation and they only had my slides, will it be useful to them? The answer should be no, no. no it should not be useful. They're only interesting because of the message the that you're delivering. Back to yeah. context. That's brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, 
Uh, my agent, Carol Brickenden, years ago, she was a brilliant uh, corporate agent, really successful. She taught me mm -hmm. how to do keynotes. She taught me the secrets. And she said, people remember the stories. Yes. A keynote, if you're doing a keynote, should be rich in stories, light on content with mm -hmm. a couple of key messages to take home, but they'll remember the stories. And we bring this into when we teach architecture yeah. of hypnosis in Toronto with the metaphors before every break. They are the stories that keep it moving. And one more point before our break here, no bizarre speech or presentation patterns. When I started doing keynotes, my wife grabbed some uh, videos of other presenters and said, oh, you should watch these. These are key people. They're doing really well. This one guy, I watched it and the word dick <laughs> was just resonating in my head. Here's what he did. He had the worst mannerisms. He said, you know, you think you're doing well, but, and then he goes out the front of the stage. He goes, what about your customers? What about your customers? What are they going to do? How are they going to feel? And what it about just them? seemed weird. It just totally freaking weird. man. What about your customers? What about them? Why are you suddenly changing into this bizarre voice pattern, <laughs> staring your eyes and look like Bill freaking Gates, except you're not doing this with your arms? <laughs> it's like just terrible. Okay. Um, we got a commercial break, though. Let's go to our commercial break, and then we'll come back we'll and come we'll back wrap and up. close quickly. Tonight on the Crosby, Stills, Black & Decker Network, it's The Bastard Show with Charlie Chuck Wagon. Well, you're effing right. It is for really who gives a flying bastard about that. Chuck Wagon here. Well, you might be surprised there's even more activity in Meaford these days. What with that super smart Dave Ambrose moving up here to live in Prado's garage? Not to mention the addicts of annex rather are better than that other dick tutor. Anyway, in this our first ever episode, I'm going to talk about food. So it seems like everyone likes good food. My own mother liked good food too. She always used to say she'd rather eat good food than bad food any old day. And damn it, she was right. Now, I hate going to someone's house and they say, Hey Chuck, how'd you like me to fix some lunch for us? I naturally say that'd be great. And then lunch arrives and it's a glass of well water and some damn little bag of salt and vinegar potato chips. You know, the ones that are so bastard small, you only get the bastards on Halloween. Well, frankly, that's what's wrong in life as far as I'm concerned. But who gives a bastard? You know, if I'm really hungry after spending the day in my home distillery or grooming the huskies with winter on the way in that, I want some real food, not some damn little bag of chips. In fact, the first meal I had when I moved up here to Gray County was a burger and fries. And that was pretty good until I found a greasy mullet hair that wound around the patty from that son of a bastard, Chef Duder. I was going to put an embedded hypnotic command at the end of my sentence to him, but then I realized that would be below me. Anyway, who gives a bastard? I'll see you in the next episode. One of the best things you can do when learning to be a good presenter is one of the most painful, and I'm not kidding. Have somebody record you presenting with a live audience and then deconstruct it yourself and be rough on yourself because it's too easy to think we did a great job when we absolutely bombed. And the exact same thing is true for social media posts because you are by nature recording yourself, so do it a lot yeah. and then watch your recordings. It's totally fine if the first few times you do this, you go... Oh man, that was a disaster. Delete, do it again. Maybe it takes you three, four, five times. And then still, you'll eventually publish it and go, okay, great, it's out there. And a year later, after you've really refined your skills, you watch something you did a year ago or two years ago and you go, that was horrible. Was horrible. Oh, and it's fine. That's going to happen to you. Bro, Accept that's it. That's so true. I mm. saw when I was my first ever event, January 29th, 1975, in Edmonton, Alberta, on mm. the Tommy Banks show, never been on TV in my life. I was a telephone operator at Bell, did a yeah. couple of mentalism effects, thought I did great. They were so poor that I saw them two years later when I was on the road. It was on TV and reruns. I was just cringing. In I two years, I'd gotten good enough that I could see how crap I used to be. I remember when I was in my 30s, I did a presentation, and I thought it went really well until I watched <laughs> the YouTube version of it later. Yeah. I think it, hopefully it's still not on there. Yeah. But there was a – I had PowerPoint, but not – again, I lived up to my own – message that I gave you earlier, which is make sure that the slides on their own should not be useful. It should be contextually relevant right, only if you right. see the presentation. And there was the big screen behind me and I had the remote control thing and I was presenting like this, but because I didn't have any kind of monitor or anything, I kept kind of doing this, you know, and making sure I could see my material uh, because painful. I hadn't, I also hadn't practiced it enough. I hadn't, I hadn't been familiar enough with what was coming up on the next slide. 
right? So that was my mistake. Had I known the material in advance and structured it and practiced it, I wouldn't be looking at the screen other than a quick glance and I would deliver to the audience, yeah. not delivering nice. my message to the screen. When I hosted the Ontario mm -hmm. Wine Awards in character as Deconductor Fresh, I made a mistake. There was no podium. There's nothing. There was no table. Mm. And I had all my notes for the whole thing. Oh, and, I and then you look like you're holding them yeah, or something. Just, just yeah. absolutely terrible. Now, if you're taking questions, if there's Q&A, repeat them for the audience because people will not hear them. And Repeat them for the audience. Because no go. one will hear them. Scare you? Um, one on one, the same skills. Listen to the other person. If they're telling you something without interrupting, not be thinking about your next point. Listen to them. Make eye contact. Let them make their point. Nod to show them that you're listening. You know what I Then sorry. respond. <laughs> Scare you? I think I was interrupting you. Maintain rapport. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Get the Q-tip out of your mouth. That was a Q-tip oh, toothpick. Toothpick, Thanks yeah. To Maintain rapport. Yeah, knowing your audience and being in rapport with them is important. The type of energy that's going to be appropriate to a group of accountants might be different than the type of energy to a, a group of high school students for a hypnosis entertainment show. Right, right, that's good. Maintain rapport. Remember, good presentation skills are a leadership skill. Yes. Good presenters can win people. You want to see this in action? Watch Kenneth Branagh in the Shakespeare film, Henry V. When he makes the St. Crispin's Day speech of, you know, we few, we happy few. Yeah. <laughs> Kenneth Branagh's got no lips. He's got a weird mouth, but he just delivers this speech. They're about to go into Agincourt and fight the French. Every time I watch that, I just want to get a freaking longbow and go and shoot some French people. <laughs> just kidding. Yeah. It's a funny line though. So don't believe oh, it. Finally, man. Chris, read your audience. Stop when you're done. I had a gig at the Royal York Hotel in Toronto. True story years ago, they paid me $7,500 for one hour of my time, which is what I was getting paid back then. They came up to me and said, you have to be very tight with the time. Where I said, I can stop to the second whenever you want me to. Just after this guy who's on. This dick, who was the glasses guy. Oh, yeah. Glasses, he went on and on. He went 12 minutes into my time. So they're going like this. And he goes, oh, okay, we're running out of time here. He just keeps going. He kept going. Finally, the CEO of the company stood up in front like this. And he goes, oh, even the CEO standing up. I'm going to wrap up in a minute. He kept going. Do you know how long my hour turned into? True story. Eight minutes. All I could tell them is what I would have taught them if I had time. I literally made the equivalent of $56,250 for that hour because That's in some, eight minutes, yeah, yeah. I made 7,500 bucks. I did the math. He was a dick. He was done and he didn't stop. Get off the stage when you're done. Leave them wanting more. Mm -hmm. Don't drill it. Don't pound it into anything. Yeah. All right. Now I'm going to just mention this as well. We right. are in the new year. We're looking at putting together a full course on this this type of material, how to do yes. awesome presentations from Mike's background. So cool. if you have questions, we would invite you to either email them or if you're watching this on YouTube, just drop them in as a comment under the video. We'd love to know what you want to know more about if we touch on this topic in more detail. Excellent. So, so give us our empowering that question. That is it. Chris. Where's the empowering question? Let's see. All right, here we go. Ask yourself, what presentation skills will I adopt as part of my life today? And when I get good at this, which I will, how will I make it into something truly exceptional? And how will the impression I make on others change and grow along with my new abilities? Brilliant. And I'll That's leave right. you with our meta five, which is one better than a metaphor. This comes from uh, two days ago. We were running out of propane mm -hmm. in our cabin. We're on the automatic fill-up thing. We have a 450-pound, they call it a piggy, right? But it's supposed to last the whole season. And they say, if it gets to 20% and it's not, you know, we haven't come and filled it, call yeah, us. So I yeah. called them on Monday. And they arrived on Wednesday. Two guys with a big budget propane, great guys. They hook up and they're filling it. And uh, he said, well, you're good for another two years now, thinking I was only using it to cook with, but we're using it for a propane fireplace. We get a year out of it. And as he got in the truck, he went like this, took his hat off, and smiled, it was Gus Grissom. I would know that brush cut anywhere. Gus Grissom filled up our propane tank. He looked very fit. He'd obviously been working out, but he was a little tired around the eyes. Thanks for listening. This has been episode 240 of the Brain Software Podcast with Mike Mandel, and I'm Chris Thompson. So head on over to MikeMandelHypnosis.com. Check out our events page. You can sign up for Foundations Live if you want, or just check out all the awesome stuff we've got for you. And we'll see you in the next episode. Thanks again, and, and good, good night. night.